Dr. John McArdle, Clinical Assistant Professor of Medicine in the Pulmonary Division and attending physician at Hartford Hospital, is here to talk about evaluation of the respiratory tract. Hello, nice to see you. Nice meeting you. I'd like to ask you several questions that are pertinent to your examination. And the first is, for evaluating the upper tract, I know you take considerable care in that, and it's a reminder to our students that respiratory examination does not begin and end with the lungs. Is it desirable to evaluate sinus transillumination in a darkened room? Yes, it is, because very often the ambient light will impair your ability to uh, to see normal transillumination in the oral cavity. And so it's generally most useful to do that in a darkened room. Well, of course, for purpose of our demonstration, we may not show that because we don't want to fade to black on the camera. Correct. For years, it's been taught that the chest radiograph may remain normal in the first day or two of pneumonia when crackles are available on pulmonary auscultation. And it's often been taught as a victory for physical diagnosis as though physical diagnosis were at war with technology rather than complementary tech technology. What is your experience with that phenomenon? It's fairly frequent that you'll see a patient who has a fever, purulent sputum production, and crackles on exam, and you'll get a radiograph that doesn't clearly define any intrapulmonary pathology. What we'll often do in that setting is treat the patient as though they have pneumonia, I have yet to see in my experience an x-ray subsequently reveal a pneumonia after the initial x-ray was negative. However, in a number of cases, we've seen patients who have subsequently gone on to get CAT scans in that setting who may have basal or infiltrates or infiltrates at the sulcus of the diaphragm, which were otherwise not accessible to the plain radiograph. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to watching your pulmonary exam. You're quite welcome. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. McArdle, and I'm just here to uh, perform a respiratory examination on you. If, um, if you just relax and as you are and breathe comfortably, okay? Okay. Now, when I perform a respiratory examination, I like to start from the head and head downward, essentially, and, and go through all the major organ systems that uh, that have significant impact on the lungs. So where I start initially is, is up at the eyes, and the things that I will look for would be any evidence of pallor in the conjunctiva. Just, so you just pull the conjunctiva down and have a look at them. Um, and that's to ascertain whether or not anemia or any blood abnormalities might contribute to a patient's sense of dyspnea. Subsequently, it's always also very important to just have a good look at the patient's eyes and assess for any evidence of, of abnormalities in the uh, eyelids, any evidence of ptosis, because as you know, ptosis and pupillary irregularities are sometimes associated with intrathoracic neoplasms. There's a Horner sign where patients will have a ptosis and meiosis of the ipsilateral pupil, which is in the setting of interruption of the cervical chain, the cervical sympathetic chain, which can sometimes be caused by an intrathoracic neoplasm. So after the cursory review of the eyes, I'd like to have a good look in the patient's nose. Could I have you lie back for me, sir? And the reason behind this is that a lot of uh, intrapulmonary pathology, such as asthma or emphysema or other um, vasculitic disorders are often accompanied with pathology in the, uh, in the nasal tree. And with an otoscope or nasal speculum, you can visualize the inferior and middle turbinates and look for any ulcerations of the nasal mucosa that might go along with some of the aforementioned problems. Likewise, palpation or percussion over the maxillary or frontal sinuses can be used in an effort to elicit tenderness or abnormal sensations in the sinus cavities. The oral exam is also very important in patients in whom you suspect intrapulmonary pathology as a number of different vasculitic disorders and pulmonary neoplasms are also uh, 
seen in patients who have higher risks of oral neoplasms or ulcerations in the oral mucosa. I'm just going to have a peek alongside your teeth, sir, and open your mouth wide. Say, ah. Ah. Uh, Again, ah. Uh, ah. Uh, okay. And I see no evidence on his exam for abnormalities of that sort. Next, I'd like to proceed to the neck. I'm just going to flex your neck up and down. Just make sure that everything moves around well. Just assessing for normal motion of the cervical spine. And then there's a series of different lymph node chains that it's important to palpate. We start with the submental nodes just under the chin. Follow with the submandibular nodes. And then the anterior cervical and posterior cervical chains, as well as the supraclavicular chains, which will often drain intrapulmonary neoplasms up into the supraclavicular area. I'm just going to have you turn your neck to the side, if you will. It's also often important in patients with significant lung disease to assess their jugular venous pressure as intrapulmonary pathology such as emphysema or pulmonary fibrosis will often lead to right heart dysfunction and subsequent elevation of the jugular venous pressure. Now it's important to try and distinguish between the jugular venous pressure waveform and the carotid pulsation. The jugular venous waveform has a far greater excursion with respiration than does the carotid pulsation, which should be unaffected by the patient's respiration. Likewise, you can alter the patient's jugular venous pressure just by pressing at the base of the neck to impede inflow into the chest. And I do not see any engorgement in John's jugular veins. Just going to lift your chin, sir, and have a good look at your trachea. You always want to examine the trachea for midline position. You place your thumbs alongside the trachea, and can I have you bend your chin up a little bit further and just take some nice deep breaths. And as he's breathing comfortably, you want to assess whether there's any evidence of what we call a tracheal tug, whether the trachea is actually impinged by something in the thorax and gets tugged downward as he breathes, and his trachea does not get tugged while he breathes. Likewise, you want to assess for midline position of the trachea because conditions that cause a shrinking of one side of the thoracic cavity will pull the trachea towards the ipsilateral side. So a condition such as severe lobar atelectasis, if he were to have a bronchogenic carcinoma obstructing his left main stem bronchus, his entire hemithorax may collapse due to lack of aeration and his trachea might be pulled over towards that side. You also might see in the setting of a tension pneumothorax where the, the contralateral chest fills up with air and the mediastinal tr structures get pushed away from the side of the pathology, the trachea might deviate away from that area. And so it's, it's a useful sign assessing outside the chest cavity for any evidence of, of intrapulmonary pathology. Now before I get to his chest itself, I'm just going to examine his nails. And what I want to look for is any evidence of clubbing. What you want to look for in the patient's nail beds is how brisk his capillary refill is, whether there's any evidence of cyanosis. The normal nail beds are, are somewhat pink in color, a, a bluish or a purplish hue uh, would be suggestive of a very low oxygen level. You also want to look at the contour of the nail itself because clubbing will very often lead to a rounded appearance to the nails. Now, not at all infrequently, patients will have a rounded appearance to their nails just as a normal variation. And one way that you can distinguish between that and pure clubbing is to ask the patient to actually put their thumbs or their fingers together and look for a space between their thumbs and fingers. If you could do that, sir. So it's not at all uncommon for some patients to have roundish appearing fingernails. And in order to distinguish that from true clubbing, it's often useful to have the patient put their first knuckle together and 
put their fingernails together. And in the non-clubbed patient, you should be able to see a space here. That's known as Shamroth sign. In the clubbed patient, you would see the fingernails together and diverge at the tip in the setting of true clubbing. And so you can see that you can see this nice space here between John's two fingernails that show that there's no clubbing present. And so John's nails are, are normal in appearance, a nice pink hue with good capillary refill and no clubbing. While I'm down on his arm, I'll go ahead and place the blood pressure cuff. And what I want to test for here is the presence of a pulses paradox. Now, the way I measure a pulses paradox is I very slowly raise the blood pressure until no sounds are audible. And then I very gradually release the blood pressure cuff. until I hear the first sounds. And then I greatly restrict the speed at which the needle falls and observe the patient's breathing. And it is a normal finding for there to be an initial period where the patient's pulse is only audible during Inspiration, or it's only audible during expiration and, and disappears during inspiration. Um, this will normally be in a range of six millimeters of mercury or less, but in the setting of either pericardial pathology or significant airway obstruction, that range will often be greater than 10. And John's is normal. Now, can I have you sit up and, and face the audience? Now, to examine the thorax, initially I'm just going to inspect the way he breathes. And as you can see, he's breathing comfortably. And uh, I will count, I generally will count the patient's respiratory rate while I'm getting their pulse so that they're not aware that I'm doing it. Because if you ask a patient to sit still while I count your breathing, very often you're going to get a respiratory rate that is nowhere near their resting respiratory rate because they're aware it's being observed. But what I look for is symmetric expansion of the thoracic cavity during during respiration, and I see no uh, chest wall or spinal deformities such as kyphosis or kyphoscoliosis, which might impact his, his respiration. What I'll do subsequently as I observe him breathe is just place my hands together on his thorax just along his lower thoracic spine and ask him to breathe in and out deeply. And what I'm looking for is any difference in the excursion of each of my thumbs, which are nestled right alongside his spine. And what I'm seeing here is fairly symmetric expansion of his chest cavity. And likewise, you can do that along the xiphoid process at the lower part of the rib cage, and just breathe for me. And you can see the excursion of my thumbs is symmetric on both sides, suggesting that there is symmetric aeration in both sides of his thoracic cavity. The next step is going to be percussion of his chest with a very sharp motion of the wrist. And you can hear the percussion tone change to dull when we get over his diaphragm. It's nice and resonant over the lung fields. And so you can see this is right around the area where it turns dull. And you can measure the patient's chest excursion. What I'll do is ask John to take a nice deep breath in. and measure the lower part of his diaphragm. You can breathe normally. Just take a few nice gentle breaths for me. And then another deep breath in. Okay, and out, sir. 
So you can see this is where his diaphragms are on full inspiration. Now you can take a few nice gentle breaths. And then breathe all the way out. And you can see that the area of dullness moves up the thorax. Nice normal breathing. And take a nice breath out for me. And we can measure this diaphragmatic excursion. As you can see, it's just about four centimeters on each side, which is normal. And while I'm palpating John's chest, the other thing that I'll ask him to do is to just uh, say the word 99 over and over. 99, 99, 99, 99, 99. And what I'm feeling for here, John, is a sound called fremitus, which is, again? 99. Again? 99. Which is a vibration through the thoracic cavity, which will sometimes be altered in the presence of fluid or consolidated lung. Fremitus will be decreased in the presence of pleural fluid that is around the thoracic cavity, but increased in the setting of uh, pulmonary consolidation or um, or significant atelectasis at certain parts of the of the lung field. And so John's fremitus uh, does certainly feel normal. Now subsequently, I'd like to just listen to John's breathing. And I'll have him breathe in and out gently through his mouth. The normal breath sounds that you'll hear are brought Particular breath sounds. Abnormalities that you may hear during this portion of the examination would include rails or crackles, which are generally present during inspiration and which can occur either early and throughout inspiration or only late in inspiration. The coarser or lower pitch of sound, the more proximal in the airway tree the abnormality tends to be. And we tend to hear coarser sounding rails in conditions of, of severe pulmonary fibrosis or severe pulmonary edema and finer rails you may hear in settings of atelectasis or in infiltrative disorders such as pneumonia. Now it's important to listen, I'm just going to have you do the same thing, over all lung fields. Or areas of the upper lobe if careful attention is not paid. Besides crackles, other sounds that the clinician might be aware of uh, would be ronchi, which are sounds that tend to occur throughout inspiration and expiration and tend to represent uh, material that is present in larger airways. So very frequently in, in hospitalized patients, people who are retaining their own secretions or who are unable to cough out secretions because they're so copious will have ronker sounds. And those are, are uh, very coarse sounds that are present throughout inspiration and expiration. And you'll often be able to hear them with the patient's mouth open from the mouth, which is very uncommon in, for you to hear rails in, uh, through the patient's mouth without the aid of your stethoscope. It, it's very often also uh, possible to feel increased fremitus in patients with significant ronchi. So those, uh, those sounds get transmitted down through the airway um, from the large airways. Other sounds that you might hear would be something called a pleural friction rub, which also tends to be present throughout inspiration and expiration and might be associated with dullness to percussion or decreased breath sounds um, through the area of a pleural effusion. Um, wheezing is another sound that is often heard and differs from the other in its, in its musical quality. 
uh, once it's heard, it's not often forgotten. Um, wheezes can occur at any time during inspiration or expiration, but we tend to see them first during the expiratory phase of the respiratory cycle. In evaluating any patients with obstructive lung diseases, one of our most useful tools is a peak flow meter. And what this allows you to do is measure the maximal flow rate that the patient is able to generate on expiration. And the way that you would instruct a patient to do this, John, I'd just ask you to stand up. It's important to do it standing as opposed to sitting. And what you'll do is you'll have the patient take a nice deep breath in, as deep as they can, put this in their mouth and blow out as hard and as fast as they can. You're looking for the maximal flow rate, and so you want them to blow out as hard and as fast as they can. I want you to take a nice deep breath, put that in your mouth, and blow out hard. Now, what I would tell John looking at that effort is that, to me, it didn't look like I, I just want you to imagine that you're turning 95 and you have a big birthday cake in front of you and you want to get all 95 candles blown out. And so you're going to blow as hard and as fast as you can because the measurement of a peak flow is actually very, it's very important that the patient's effort be maximal. And uh, John's effort to me did not look like as good as he would be able to do. So he's up around 400, so we're getting there. And what you'll generally ask the patient to do is to perform that three different times, and you'll take the highest number of the three. Okay, very good. And those measures tend to be lower in patients who are in the setting of a, of a significant asthma exacerbation or who have obstructive lung disease that is active at the time of the maneuver. Um, and so it's a, it's a very useful tool in evaluating how active somebody's asthma might be. If you know what their normal peak flow rate is, you can see what kind of a decrement they have by performing that, uh, that procedure at the bedside. I want to thank you for your time. Thank you. And I hope that wasn't too uncomfortable for Not you. Not at all. Okay. Very good. Thanks.